I grew up as something that is now referred to as a theater kid. But back in my day, we were just called gay. In fact, I was called gay so many times that I thought I was gay for about six months. However, my actual gay friend informed me that I wasn't, but he was flattered that I gave it a go. <laughs> Luckily, my mom realized her son would probably be the lead in the crucible before he could ever hit a home run, so she put me in an after-school theater program. I was surrounded by like-minded weirdos who sang the second act of South Pacific like we meant it. I aligned with six other guys who acted just like me and were around the same age as me. We dressed in dumb outfits, wore capes and suits to the mall, put on Hawaiian shirts and neckties daily, and spent every free moment either at rehearsal or figuring out things to do that didn't include drugs. We hated drugs, something I kind of spearheaded as my sister was an addict and gave me every example I needed to steer clear of drugs in general. This was another thing that would bring me and my mom closer, as not only did she love the fact I was worried about losing my tap shoes, but also that I thought stoners were loners and losers abusers. <laughs> to get our kicks, my friends and I did other things, things that in the long run were probably a lot more stupid and at times more dangerous than drugs. When we were younger, it was more innocent troublemaking kind of stuff, toilet papering houses, skipping school to go see movies, or going over to our one friend's house with cable so we could watch the squiggly lines on the Spice Channel or Playboy Channel and swear back and forth we saw a nipple. <laughs> when we were old enough to drive, everything changed. It was almost like overnight we decided it was time to try and kill ourselves. It started with doorbell ditching. We thought it would be funny. You'd score points for different things like style, how long you waited for them to come to the door, if they came to the door or just the window, etc. We also developed different types of doorbell ditching. Two people would doorbell ditch one house, or one, por one person did two houses that were next to each other. We also ended each night with something called a deep impact and an Armageddon. Armageddon was when everyone in the car, including the driver, would get out and knock on a different house all at the same time. <laughs> deep impact, was when we all got out and did the same house together. <laughs> it wasn't the safest of activities, but at least we weren't doing drugs because we knew that would keep our parents happy. And one of the most important parts about being a theater kid is that above all else, you needed to keep your parents happy. They paid for classes, for costumes, or whatever else you needed. They drove you to rehearsals if you didn't drive, and they let everyone come over after opening night or closing night for pizza and choreographed dances to Devo. My mom and I already had a fantastic relationship because so far I was the one kid she had who hadn't been arrested or dishonorably discharged from the Navy. <laughs> I gave her no reason to worry and fret because I had seen firsthand that that got you nowhere. So I played it cool and was a pretty fucking wonderful kid who did some awesome shit that the whole family could enjoy. She loved coming to see me in shows, loved that all my friends were silly and loud and verbally a little too witty for their age or self-comprehension. She found my crew amusing and delightful and pretty much let me do whatever I wanted as long as I was home when she told me to be home. My mom trusted me to not get myself or anyone else killed and would often let me stay out till around 10 or 11 at night on the weekdays and 11 or 12 on the weekends. This was easy to stay true to because it was already later than most parents would allow their kids to stay out till, and it was a perfect curfew time because my friends and I always wanted to watch Letterman or Conan anyway. Our little excursions into the unknown territory of Norman Rockwell-style crime always went undetected, and ultimately, if we were ever found out, the actions themselves might be so dumb we'd be forgiven on pure empathy. <laughs> this was almost the case with what became known as the West Tech Bandits. A friend of ours lived in a big house on Mount Soledad. His dad was kind of a dick, so we made a little game of always stealing his West Tech home security sign that was stuck in his yard. <laughs> it was a blue octagon-shaped sign that stood no taller than three feet. Whenever he replaced the sign, we'd take it again. He got so angry that he eventually put out cameras to guard his security sign. Someone in our group decided to collect all the West Tech signs we had taken throughout the year and place them all in his lawn. <laughs> While he was doing it, he took a couple signs from neighbors' yards as well and thus began a new game. <laughs> we started stealing West Tech signs. Only West Tech signs. Why? Because we didn't do drugs. 
You had to go in pairs for what we decided were safety reasons, although there was absolutely nothing involved to make us unsafe other than possibly scratching your arm on a shrub that blocked the sign in some way, or maybe the sign was rusty. The truth was we went in pairs because we didn't trust the other person to be honest. I mean, the game was built on the pettiest of thefts, so why wouldn't you lie about where you took the signs from? And that was a huge part of the scoring system. Location, city, and yard placement. If you stole a sign from Claremont or Linda Vista or Santee, you got one point. But if you stole it from Del Mar or La Jolla or the emerging Sabre Springs neighborhood, you got two points. <laughs> if there was a gate in front of the house but the gate was open and you stepped inside the gate to take the sign, five points. <laughs> if the sign was in the very front of the yard, one point. Middle of the yard, two. Next to the front door, three points. You needed another person there to verify this or you got zero. We had a notebook where the scores were kept. And our friend Brian Ritchie was quickly becoming the greatest West Tech bandit of all time. He would steal multiple signs on the same run. He would announce he was stealing it. He would even doorbell ditch and steal signs. <laughs> we would giggle like 12-year-old boys who just saw a nipple through squiggly lines. The best West Tech run you could ever go on was still Mount Soledad. It was the El Dorado of small blue octagon warning signs. Cibola for idiots and hatchbacks. On a good night, we got anywhere from 15 to 20 signs, and we felt like kings. We'd tally scores over late-night burritos and then head home in time to catch Conan and decide what we want to do with the signs in the back of our cars. After about a month of living out the lyrics to a cautionary Christian punk song, <laughs> I'll let that one get to the back. <laughs> we decided that we would have a West Tech bandit sleepover. A true sign of a real gang of thugs. <laughs> Sleeping bags and heated debates on what girl in our theater class would make a better Annie Oakley. <laughs> the plan was to go out and steal as many West Tech signs as possible and then come back to my house and revel in our glory. All went according to plan and we had a bounty that would make Solomon blush. We had hauled in at least 50 signs, mainly West Tech, but since we started to run out of those, we took whatever we could find. The night was coming to a close, and we needed to get back to my house, but our king, Brian Ritchie, had an idea. Doesn't Junior Seau live on top of Mount Soledad? <laughs> this was before Seau's tragic death and before cell phones that did anything other than operate as phones or let you play snake. <laughs> Nothing for that, really? <laughs> Bunch of lead his assholes in this room, all right. <laughs> we didn't know anything for sure, but Brian's claim was backed up by a rumor from Nick and a one-time sighting from Matt who lived on Mount Soledad. In fact, Matt seemed to know which house was Seau's, and this was enough for us. So we drove off to the top of the mountain to find the legendary linebacker's mansion. We pulled up to a house with a gate, and there was a Chargers bumper sticker on the SUV parked directly behind the gate. We had found it. Junior Seau's house. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> Brian Ritchie hopped out, first followed by Nick and then I. Matt was driving the getaway car, and our other friend Joe had no desire to mess with Seau's house. Samoans have big families, man. You mess with one, you mess with all of them. <laughs> However, this was the mecca of our game. This was Junior Seau's house. Surely he had an armed guard, cameras everywhere, and alarms in place to alert the other chargers he'd been robbed and they would need to come beat the shit out of us. <laughs> As we moved closer, one by one we began to chicken out, except Brian. He crept slowly toward the sign, which was stuck in the yard directly in front of the gate and next to a palm tree, a palm tree in the yard. Brian quickly nabbed the sign, ran back to the car, and we took off to my house, high-fiving and laughing the entire way. When we got back to my house, everything was dark, but the front door was open, and in the doorway, in the dark, stood my mom. We got back at 12.30 a.m., a half hour past curfew. My mom didn't say a word. She just flipped on the hallway light, looked at me, and walked up the stairs to her room. My insides crumbled. I felt like my gut was melting away and my eyes started to get heavy. I had broken my mother's trust. I had, for the first time, given her a reason to question what I was doing and where I had been. I ran upstairs after her, but she just shut the door and told me to go to bed. We camped out in the living room as one by one the bandits fell asleep to the sounds of Max Weinberg swinging drums. I closed my eyes and prayed my mom would be more reasonable in the morning. 
We were woken up bright and early the next day to the sounds of metal clanging together and my mom yelling at us to get up. We wiped the sleep from our eyes to see my mom standing next to Matt with all of our West Tech signs piled at their feet. <laughs> I immediately started crying. <laughs> Matt told me about your little West Tech sign nonsense, my mom said. This morning I went outside and saw these signs in the back of his car. He told me everything, including Junior Seau. This was not good. <laughs> Mainly because my mom was attracted to Junior Seau on a level that she usually reserved for Captain Jean-Luc Picard. <laughs> I've called all your mothers, and they want you home right away. Everyone quickly left except Matt. My mom told me that I was grounded for a week, and then told me that Matt would be driving her and I around to return every sign we stole to the house we stole it from. We were pretty sure this was half punishment and half my mom hoping to get an at-home glimpse of Seau. <laughs> we started the drive and quickly realized we didn't remember where any of these signs were from, so we just started putting the signs in empty yards <laughs> up and down Mount Soledad. <laughs> we finally got to Seau's house. The SUV was in the same spot and the gate was closed. I jumped out and put the sign next to the palm tree, and my suspicions were confirmed when my mom also got out of the car and stood with her arms crossed, watching. As I stuck the sign back in the ground, I heard the gate start to open, and I jumped to the other side of the tree. I was sort of trapped, and I couldn't get to the other side of the, tree, uh, of the street. The SUV started up and began to pull out of the driveway. The windows were tinted, and I desperately tried to get a look inside. As the SUV drove by, Matt's car had stopped, and I heard a man's voice asking if my mom and Matt needed help. They didn't. It wasn't Junior Seau. The SUV drove off, and my mom looked just as disappointed as Matt and I. When I got back in the car, I pulled out the West Tech Bandit scoring notebook and crossed out Brian's extra points for stealing a professional athlete's sign. We drove around for another 30 minutes or so, putting signs in yards. Finally, my mom realized we didn't know what sign went where, and she started to laugh at the stupidity of all of it. She told us to go back home and that I was still grounded. This is how it starts, she said, and this is where it ends. I promised to never break curfew again, and then we got ice cream. <laughs> Several years later, Brian Ritchie decided to get married, and for his bachelor party, he wanted to do three things. Listen to the original Broadway cast recording of Rent while driving around stealing West Tech signs and doorbell ditching. He also wanted to have dinner at Seau's restaurant in Mission Valley, which we thought was ridiculously funny and upsetting because Seau's is not known for food. <laughs> we rented a back conference room and filled it with close friends and awkward soon-to-be brothers-in-law. After a while, the manager of Seau's came to the back room and asked for Brian. We thought we were in trouble for being so loud, but he pulled Brian aside to tell him that someone wanted to stop in and say hi. It was Junior Seau. <laughs> he walked in with either four or 44 other Samoan guys <laughs> and said he wanted to congratulate us and buy a round of drinks. We lost our minds. <laughs> Without skipping a beat, Brian ran out of the room and emerged with a freshly stolen West Tech sign from earlier that evening and asked Say how to sign it. <laughs> <laughs> he did. <laughs> and we laughed for three days. The day Junior Seau died, a few of us bandits got together and had a drink in front of the house that we always thought was Seau's. <laughs> we clunk our glasses together, shared some laughs, yelled to the moon that theater kids could also like sports. And as the night came to an end, we stole every single home security sign on the block. <laughs> However, I made sure we were all home by midnight. Dallas McLaughlin, everybody!